Den Haag terug in het theater aan het Spui voor onze laatste gast van vandaag, de uh, Border Sessions, het festival on technology and society. Ik moet het elke keer weer even opzoeken, maar dat is wat het is. Um, inmiddels weer een gast aangeschoven aan tafel, de laatste van vandaag. Morgen zijn we terug. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Tong Hui Hu. I'm a professor of English and Digital Studies at the University of Michigan. And, and, and why are you here? I'm here because my book, A Prehistory of the Cloud, uh, just uh, got published. Uh, it's a book that looks at the origins of the cloud, not just as a technology, but as an idea. So uh, where did the cloud come from? It came out of things like sewer lines or railroad tracks, uh, guerrilla television, military bunkers, all these things that we don't really think of as being actually in the cloud right now, but so helped shape its development. And if you have to explain to people you don't know at a party what it is you do or what it is you are writing about, what, what do you tell them? Yeah, I mean, the first question that uh, my book answers is, where is the cloud, right? It's something that we don't really think that much about because we just sort of think it's somewhere, you know, out in virtual space. But um, I look at where the data centers are, where the fiber optic cables are. One example is that uh, in the U.S. at least, um, the fiber optic cables are laid over railroad track uh, from the 19th century. So a big phone company like Sprint, um, which is probably the equivalent of KPN, um, is actually an acronym. It stands for Southern Pacific Railroad Internal Network. All these ways in which 21st century technologies are layered on top of a 19th century technology, the way that these things that we think of as completely new and modern, we think of the cloud as coming in maybe five years ago, but actually the ideas behind it have been developing for hundreds of years. Yeah, so, so why is it uh interesting to know about the history of the cloud? I think it's interesting because, um, you know, we, we have a very sort of narrow view of a lot of technology. We just sort of think of it as, you know, um, coming into existence uh, very recently. And once you start looking at these patterns that um, occur in the cloud, I mean, you start asking, why are there so many data centers and military bunkers, right? Then you can start seeing that these patterns are recurring, right? So maybe there's some idea about security and data security that um, was that we had during the Cold War, during the 1960s, that has come back. So the question is, why is society like this now? Why are we suddenly anxious again about our data? Um, who do we think the new threat is? Um, so I think that's what history can do, is it can help us sort of understand um, these things as not just being part of, you know, a really good piece of code or a really good piece of software, but in fact, um, as part of something that our society wants, um, our, our, our cultural fantasy of what um, we want from a network or what we want from uh, storing data or whatever mm -hmm. else. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, well, it, it, your work is about history, but it's also about technology. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, so what sort of role do you feel the technology plays in, in current society? I mean, I think that uh, technology plays an interesting role. I mean, I think that um, a lot of my students who are graduating uh, don't really look for full-time jobs. Um, they look for several jobs, you know, stacked together, and that's in part because, you know, they can freelance for one, um, you know, cloud labor company, um, and they can pick up something else and maybe sell something, you know, uh, off their uh, social media profile. Um, I mean, I think technology is really interesting, but actually, I would say that for a book that seems to be primarily about technology, one of the interesting things that it does is it says, you know. There's only so much you can get by looking at um, the fiber optic cables or the pipes or the uh, hardware. Um, you have to actually look at something else, which is what we desire as a culture. Um, and so it's that sort of pairing of the two um, that allows us to make um, or actually see the cloud clearly. Yeah. So, so is there a pairing or is there a clash between the two? Um, I mean, I think that there's no question that the technology side is winning uh, these days. That, yeah. I mean, our default response to anything that happens or anything that goes wrong is to sort of say, oh, um, Silicon Valley or wherever your uh, favorite um, app developer is, uh, <laughs> please build us a better app to fix our problem, right? And I think that that says something about our imagination. Um, it, that's actually been sort of um, constrained somehow because we think that technology is this sort of mystical power that can solve all problems. Um, so I hear that. So it tells something about our lack of, lack I think of that's right. imagination. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Our imagination now, and you know, it, it hasn't always been this way, and it comes in and out through time. Um, but um, I mean, I think that when I again look at uh, students graduating, their goal now is not to work. Uh, normally, it's to uh, make a million dollars. Um, creating an app or doing a startup or going out to um, Stanford. Um, 
so I, I think that's very interesting. Uh, what, what sort of happened to all the other possibilities um, that uh, we used to imagine? Mm -hmm. so, so does that worry you or does it scare you? Or do you think, well, it, it's a phase, it will pass and... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess that's right. I mean, you know, as somebody who used to work uh, in uh, Silicon Valley myself, I was a network engineer. Um, so, I mean, why, why should I bite the hand that, that sort of fed me? I mean, why am I here except the fact that I write about technology, right? Uh -huh. So, I mean, I think that we should be a little bit scared, but maybe not for the reasons that we normally think. Um, if you read in the media, I mean, all of these sort of problems about privacy or internet freedom, um, my book actually argues that that's sort of looking at the wrong um, thing to be worried about. Um, so, in a way, uh, yeah, I mean, as you said, uh, technology will come in and out of fashion um, and so I mean I may be dead by the time you know the next cycle <laughs> comes around but I'm not sort of worried um, for that uh, reason yeah there are also people who tell uh, who say well technology is is the solution for everything it will solve the right. the, the problems we have in this world uh, right. with with food or with the mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, rising water and mm -hmm. things like that how do you feel about that I mean it's true I've, I've certainly I mean certainly at this festival there'll be a lot of people like that and I mean I remember I remember going to the MIT Media Lab um, in the 90s uh, when people uh, thought, well, you know, if only we gave uh, everybody in India um, who is very poor a computer, um, then, you know, all corruption would be solved and all sort of society would be better. Um, but then they kind of forgot about the fact that uh, they needed electricity for the <laughs> computers. And I mean, so I'm not, I, again, I'm not here to um, say that. Uh, you know that's that's not wrong, but there are actually a lot of social problems that um, need to be solved at the same time as technology. You can't just sort of like hand everybody now a smartphone and sort of hope that um, the society will magically reinvent itself. No. So so what so what do we need as well? Um, I actually think that we need uh, imagination, and I know that that sounds very um, shallow. But uh, you know, I also teach creative writing. I, I'm a I, I, I'm a poet myself, um, and I think that. Um, one of the problems that we have is that we don't have enough words almost to imagine possibilities. Um, that the sort of, if the only kind of possibility we can imagine is pressing a button on a phone, then um, that sort of constrains the kinds of options. It also is a problem in terms of economic class. Um, if you write something that sort of assumes you need an iPhone, then um, that's a problem for a lot of people who don't um, have the means to afford an iPhone or pay for cell service. Um, what happens, though, is that those become a set of defaults, right? So um, just as you log into a new website and it sort of fills out parts of the form for you, so it says, oh, by default, you're 25 to 34, um, and, you know, your interests are this and that. I mean, what that does is it sort of assumes that everybody should be, you know, of that same age group or that um, kind of demographic, and that doesn't um, imagine other possibilities of people who don't fit into that norm. Um, mm -hmm. So my joke about... Uh, which uh, is everybody's joke, um, is that, uh, you know, I, I lived in San Francisco for about 10 years, and right now all the new companies that are coming out there are essentially companies that help 21-year-old um, boys uh, take care of their life, uh, pretending to be their mom, essentially. So you have an app to pick up your laundry, you have an app to deliver your food, you have an app to go shopping <laughs> for you. Um, it's everything they need. <laughs> yeah. But then you sort of wonder, like, well, what about, like, the world that isn't, like, a 20-year-old yeah, yeah. boy, right? <laughs> Who can do it? <laughs> Just yeah. Exactly. <laughs> or you have like other needs, right? I mean, uh -huh. so, um, you know, the famous, uh, there's a company that tried to um, reinvent or disrupt um, public transportation by having its own very expensive buses. You could press a button and a bus would sort of tell you when the bus would show up and then take you to work. Um, now, there's a perfectly functioning bus system already there. Um, and what they did to make this happen is they took out the uh, wheelchair ramps for people who are using wheelchairs so that they could fit more um, juice bars inside of their buses. Um, well, I mean, clearly that's an example of someone who never sort of imagined that someone who needed a wheelchair would possibly need to get around, yeah, right? But yeah. um, it just wasn't part of their imagination. That's why I sort of say that um, if we could broaden our imagination of um, who's using it and what we're using it for, I think that would be good. And I think that's something, this is why we need something, um, we need difference, right? We need a different kind of imagination for um, technology. I could say the same thing about race. Um, there was a web tracking camera um, made by HP a few years ago that uh, 
couldn't tell if you were black. It was the idea was that it would track your face, right? And it would sort of follow your face around um, as as you moved. You do a, a webcast, and then the camera would move as well. But no one had ever tested it on someone who was black. And so, if you were black and you bought this camera, you'd move around and nothing would happen, and it was as if you were invisible. <laughs> it was just because they had sort of never imagined. Like, I don't know. Everyone's white, so therefore, you know, we wow. we did our testing and stuff. Um, it wasn't like a conscious act of racism, but it was just this. Um, you know, this sense that, you know, everybody who is a user is, you know, um, someone who looks like someone in our testing lab. And, yeah. and that's an example of why we need to urgently expand it. Yeah. So who, where does this well, ex expand your needs to come from? Because you say we need more imagination. I, c I can say the same, but, but yeah. where do we find it? Who, who puts it in society? Who, who, who yeah. encourages people to... to to, well, to look uh, in yeah. different directions. Well, I think that that's the role of the humanities and the arts, right? Um, so it, in one sense, everybody is trying to quantify um, data and try to use that in the classroom. So um, I can see that even English departments such as mine are trying to figure out, well, we don't really need to read the books. We just need to write an algorithm that counts the words and sort of says, this is the most important word. I think that's a terrible idea because um, you know, there are certain things that you do with reading, right? You sort of spend time with something, um, and, and that has and to. And sometimes the words, uh, well, uh, you can count words, but yeah. sometimes they mean something really different Absolutely. when you read the sentence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a poem is um, sort of by definition a weird use of words. So <laughs> if you write algorithms that sort of count the most likely use of words, then poems always sort of fall out. And this is where we get things like you know Shakespeare or um, any of the other Milton or any of the other great poets um, out there. So I think the the truth is that. I mean, the job of the humanities has kind of always been to bridge, um, to sort of help make sense of what's happening. And I think that, I mean, people are worried about jobs and they aren't majoring in the humanities because they're like, that doesn't get me any money. But even things like uh, media marketing, media strategy, um, I mean, literature is one form of media, you know, film is another form of media. And if you want to understand media, you have to understand the entire media environment, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that's... Uh, and then people who are in the arts um, actually help make media, right? Um, graphic designers or painters or sculptors or musicians. Um, and, you know, maybe they end up uh, making a lot of money. I was thinking the other day about how, um, you know, the opening sequence of um, all these Hollywood films are actually these very avant-garde filmmakers. Uh, so the opening sequence for, uh, uh, I think, uh, Vertigo, uh, hit Alfred Hitchcock's yeah. film, um, is actually this like very avant-garde guy who's really interested in spirals. Um, so I'm not saying that they, they are incompatible. I'm just um, saying that, um, you know, that's actually the riskiest thing to do right now is not to major in business, but actually to think about something that isn't directly, doesn't have a sort of obvious outcome in one to four years, but maybe has a, a really huge impact five to ten years down the line. Are you optimistic about the future? Um, no, I'm a grouchy person. I was uh, grouchy since I was born. I, I think I have the, um, uh, the inner body of an eight-year-old man that you know, has a stick and beats people. So, um, but I think that uh, you know, there, there's a role for um, uh, grouchy for people as well. As well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think that um, you know, it's almost like there, there's uh, so much of the economy, you, you have to be a professional optimist for a living. Like, um, this is where a lot of people make their money, um, sort of saying like, wonderful things about the future. So I think you need like, one or two people like me to balance that out. Oké, okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Oké, okay. dat was het voor vandaag. De laatste gast, hij verlaat nu de tafel. Um, uh, morgen zijn we terug. 11 uur.